Welcome into Case Dead Online. I am Mason Voth, Derek Young, Drew Galloway, all here with you on this Wednesday before the 4th of July, the 3rd of July, as they call it, have called it that for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's, yeah, they're a special day for everybody out there, the 3rd of July. Uh, go waste your money on fireworks right now, as Drew knows uh, from other videos that might be coming in the near future. Uh, before we get into the main topic of today, which is the Big 12 media thinking that K-State lacks talent, uh, let's talk real quick about an actual piece of talent that they have or will be having, because uh, this is the first time we've all gotten together since they had, they added Lincoln Cure to their 2025 recruiting class. Um, that we've had a couple of days for it to kind of settle in now and everything else that's gone on with it. Um, and Drew and I certainly talked about it with our commit breakdown. But to you, D.Y., what does it mean in the grand scheme of things that K-State was able to land Lincoln Cure and what, what does it actually do for him? Because I think back to the class of 23 and think about similar time in the summer when K-State went Dylan Edwards and then about a week later they landed Avery Johnson and it just led to a ton of momentum on the recruiting trail. Never mind the fact that Dylan Edwards ended up not at K-State initially, but you still had that little moment where it felt like there was a lot of energy. Uh, does Lincoln Cure provide something like that or is there something more significant to him coming to K-State? It's less just because he's not a quarterback. So in terms of, you know, convincing or persuading others, probably is it going to have the same sway. But that doesn't mean it's not just as significant or close to as significant in my mind because he is the highest ranked high school commit in school history. I think that says something in itself, even – if he were not to be the most productive player, which I think he will be, it is a nice perception thing too, because you, you know, he's going to be the number one or the number two player in the state. You got the number one player in the state last year in Gus Hawkins, year before Avery Johnson. So you're kind of going on this run, at least locally, that you you're able to sustain. But it, you know, in the day and age. And people don't like when I bring this discussion to the forefront, but I still think it's one that is necessary and exists. And to ignore it is to be naive. Is this growing at least financial gap between what Kansas State is at the Big 12 and what the Big 10 and SEC are? So if you're a program like Kansas State, and I don't think there's a lot of Big 12 programs that are doing this, and you're, you know, still winning your share of recruiting battles against those Big Ten and those SEC programs, I think it keeps you in the conversation and relevant and not drifting off into that group of five landscape that, you know, that some have concerned themselves over. I think you still remain relevant enough to be on the national landscape and to be, you know, on the big stage, even if it's a little bit left of center. So I think for that purpose, I think it's humongous. And I, I don't think a lot of Big 12 programs, when you combine what they do on the field and what they are doing recruiting, can really rival what K-State is on right now under Chris Kleiman. Drew, uh, to, in your eyes, what did the, the Lincoln Cure commitment mean for K-State and, and what's it kind of state to others? I just think that it, it just proves that K-State is here to stay more than anything. And I, I just think that beating out pretty much every power four school in the country to get uh, Lincoln Cure is just kind of like a, a major example of not, or uh, not really like leaving and K-State still being a really relevant program. And also just from the, the perspective of like growing up with K-State and everything, never in a million years would I have thought that it was possible for K-State to even like land a five star. It was something that was really just, kind of like a, a daydream or like something that you do on the NCAA football video games and KZ gets it done in real life. And I, I think that that's a, a big deal and something really important. And I think that the other thing too, is that this is how k State would land a five star, like realistically in the next like five to 10 years, if they were to do it again, it would be something like Lincoln Cure situation. Yeah. I was going to say, you say I never would have imagined K-State landing a five star. I don't know that I would have ever imagined 
somebody not in like the KC metro area uh, being able to become a five star. It just it d- doesn't seem like one of those things happen, and especially like because uh, we've seen some really high profile guys in in the KC metro recently, but like they're there for different reasons where they're not, the ties are not local and they don't have that. Whereas Lincoln cure, obviously a Goodland kid, like there are ties there to the state of Kansas uh, and, and some of the others. So significant for K state. And it's, it was the perfect storm for K state. Like nobody should uh, treat this for anything more than what it is. Like K state doesn't get Lincoln cure. If he's from, you know, probably Beatrice, Nebraska, you know, that's not what's happening. But he was from Goodland, Kansas instead. So I think that's probably uh, something to keep in mind. But uh, to me, it signifies that K-State obviously has three things. So they've got the ability to highlight they can get guys to the NFL. Ben Sennett, check. They did that with a guy that was a walk-on. So imagine what you can do with a five-star type of tight end. Number two, you still have to be able to play the NIL game in this day and age for guys like this, even if there's that emotional tie locally or whatever else, like there's enough money going around in college football that you're going to have to be able to prove, Hey, we can kind of swing with everybody else here. And K state has proven in in every sport that they've needed to now that they can swing at that level with other people when it's necessary. So that's another thing. And then third, the local thing, that's, that's the, those are the three perfect things that K state had going for them. And, it's you know pretty easy to say because I think K State's got a lot right going for him right now, but uh, it's it's another testament to Chris Kleiman and then above that Gene Taylor and everything else that funnels down below those guys. So Beatrice, Nebraska, that's what you came up with there. Yeah, I like how that was the that was the small. Is that it was really small pronounced thing. that way? Yeah, yeah, it's really pronounced Beatrice. So yeah, mm, there yeah, you go. I would have went Beatrice. I was I, hope, I was trying I to find a, a a small town uh, somewhere, and that was the first one that came to my head. So. I, would, I hope somebody was watching from Beatrice, Nebraska. <laughs> uh, they are. They should go in the comments. Uh, Panama, Nebraska. There's another one for Carney? you. Carney? No, or is that too big? Carney's probably think- too big. Carney, yeah, Carney's too big. Yeah, the population of Carney is thirty-four thousand. Too big, probably. <laughs> Although I don't know the, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's Ada, probably Ada, big. Oklahoma, Ada, Oklahoma. May, yeah, maybe. Uh, Carney, Nebraska is almost eight times bigger than Goodland, so <laughs> they're eight times more likely to produce a five-star tight end than Goodland is. Just wow. raw math, right there. Ada, Ada Oklahoma, sixteen thousand. Yeah, okay, I could, I could give you that one. All, but I'll, I'll raise you one, and I'll just say Alva, Oklahoma. Alva, Oklahoma. There, they're they're well, just you know, over five thousand. So, you know why I said Ada, Oklahoma? Because well, I went to college at Ohio Northern. That was in Ada, Ohio. Mm, okay, a couple of Ada boys. D Y M, the theoretical five star recruit we're talking Ada, about. Ada, Ada, Ohio population five thousand. <laughs> there you go. Uh, five all right. thousand. Three thousand is probably the campus. Also, it was right where uh, about ten minutes where Ben Roethlisberger grew up. Oh, shout out to Big Ben. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, I was going to try and find, well, actually, I, no, I'm not going to do it. That'd be inappropriate of me. Not nice. There's low-hanging fruit there that I could bring up if we're wanting to go from Big Ben to all Big 12 awards preseason. And the most notable thing is K-State apparently sucks, but they also don't suck, according to the media poll that came in this week, because – the Wildcats were picked to finish second in the Big 12. They were one first place vote behind Utah. Utah got 20. K State got 19 of them, but not a single Wildcat on the all Big 12 preseason team, offense or defense. Uh, were either of you shocked by that development? No, I was not. I, th- I don't know if it was a conversation that we had, or at least that I had elsewhere. I, I remember mentioning, I think I wrote about it, is that. You can make an argument that Kansas State's going to win the Big 12, get second, get third, whatever it may be. However, that you order those top four or five teams. But when you're actually – and if we have to take into account how voters vote too, right, they're not necessarily voting on projection when when they do these all Big 12 teams. That's that's the the gist here, right? 
And if you're not doing projection and you're kind of doing what Last have you achievement. Already, yeah, or what have you already done for me? Like I've said, this is the concern if you were for K-State, like because every team has its flaws, that a lot of these guys that they're going to be counting on, and especially on the offensive side of the ball, have yet to do anything. They're going to be playing a chunk, a good chunk of offensive linemen that have yet to do anything. They're going to start a tight end that has done very little. They're going to start basically all, every wide receiver that plays will have done very little. Uh, DJ Giddens might be the only player on the offensive side of the ball that will play a lot besides Hadley Panzer that has played and done a lot. So I understand, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And you can't really go DJ Giddens. You can. If, I wouldn't fault for someone for putting DJ Giddens on the All-Big 12 team, but I would go Ollie Gordon before him. I would go Devin Neal before him. The voters went Taj Brooks before him. So that's where you kind of run into something. And for Adley Panzer and to another extent, maybe Carver Willis, uh, I don't think Carver Willis has done enough yet. Adley Panzer may have, but you got to go look at those offensive line that have everyone essentially coming back at all three of Arizona, Oklahoma State, and West Virginia. Those three teams are probably going to occupy most of those picks, and I think they did. Defensively, your defensive line is basically brand new, especially on the edge. The interior, Uso Samalo, been banged up a lot, hasn't done enough yet to really take away doubts. Linebackers, Austin Moore had a really good sophomore year or junior year because I guess this is his super, super senior year. I thought he regressed a little last season, so I think the voters probably took that into account a little bit. Desmond Purnell deserves to be on it. I think he's good enough. But then you got – who are you going to take out between Jacob Manu of Arizona – and then the two Oklahoma State guys, Nick Nick Martin and Colin Oliver, because mm -hmm. all three of those are deserving. Keen Garver has barely played quarterback in his career. I think last year was the first full season, and he didn't even start half the year, I don't think. Jacob Parrish, still pretty young, still hasn't done a lot. B.J. Payne, fairly young, still hasn't done a lot. Um, Jordan Riley, new to the team. Marquis Siegel, probably deserving. He was, I think he played at an all-Big 12 level last year. Um so if maybe there's a snub, there's th then he would be it. But I'm looking through those five defensive backs that got picked. I mean, you know, the, even those two guys at KU, they're probably deserving. Travis Hunter, pretty deserving. Takario Davis of Arizona, pretty deserving. So I just – K-State has a few cases, but there's also not one that jumps out and says they got screwed. Yeah, I wasn't too surprised either. I mean, we talked about it in May. We did that video right after uh, D.Y. wrote his story, and we kind of talked about what could potentially happen. We kind of laid out the scenario where we didn't think that KZ was going to get anybody on the first team list. And I think that where we're going in college football in the Big 12 right now, that I know that it, it's kind of a chore to come up with 10 offensive linemen. But I think that we're kind of in that realm where if you have 16 teams, you probably should have two teams because I think that it just makes more sense. And you have a lot of guys that are probably deserving to be on a team that end up not because like Devin Neal isn't, yeah. DJ Giddens isn't. So I, I think that you can it. make it. I also even. don't think it matters enough for me to really want a second team. My argument for this is if you're going to have the media do the standings, I'm okay with that. But when it comes to like offensive linemen, defensive linemen, and linebackers, I mean, we talked about it. We were having trouble finding dudes. I'm not sure the media should be the ones making the team. That might might be probably the Big 12 coaches that should be doing that. Yeah, because yeah. uh, look, and and like I, uh, I I've tried to explain this for people to to understand this, but uh, when I say that like we don't know offensive linemen, we know like three offensive linemen around the league, not on K-State's roster, but it's tough to find five or whatever. So you have to go and do, you know, all this different research, but then it's subjective because you're not actually watching them. It's just kind of tossing something and hoping it sticks and that. And there, so what I'm trying to say is then there are people that are voting in this that know a lot less than even we do about this topic. And they're having to throw stuff out and, there. And there's no statistical measure for an offensive lineman really mm -hmm. either. Uh, unless you look at sacks allow, which can be a little, 
deceiving at times. Um, or if you want to hold PFF as a major gospel, you could use that. But like the five off to the line thing I named, I know who Joe Savanea was from Arizona, but I bet I doubt everyone did. I knew Joe Mikulski of Oklahoma State because he was pretty good last year, but also because he's from Kansas City. And I knew Wyla Milam because he was one of the guys for West Virginia that got recognized at the end of the year. To he was honest, the only he was the only one that was on the team last year that still had eligibility. Right. But <laughs> like one of the five off the linemen on the all big 12 team is Luke Cantor of Cincinnati. To be honest, I don't know who that is. Like I don't. Yeah, no, it's, it's just one of those things where I, I honestly, at the end of the day, it's probably better uh, in terms of stuff like this to not have two teams because then, you know, there are more included. So now we, we can get our gripes off and everything, but I, Ultimately, like looking at this in an honest way, I, I'm with you, D.Y. It's, it's tough to pinpoint where you would have put a wildcat in. And it just also comes down to how do you view this? Or are you going to do it through the lens of I can project? You know, I, I'm smart enough to use my brain to say that, OK, this guy has this talent. He has this team, this staff, all this around him. By the end of the year, I think he will play like this. Um, that's theoretically how I do it, a combination of, hey, I know what this guy has done, so if he's good enough, he's not getting knocked off his pedestal. Um, I mean, that's why Ollie Gordon and Devin Neal were my two running back selections. But I'm also smart enough to look around and say, okay, I feel like I can project that by the end of the year, I think Avery Johnson is going to be the best quarterback in this league. Uh, and, and others, I, I'm not going to fault them for looking and, and taking the safe route of you know going with a guy – like Shadur Sanders, who ultimately ended up getting it uh, because, you know, that that's a possible first round NFL draft talent right there. So it's all just about the criteria that you're looking for. And the spots that K-State had legitimate candidates for came on the offensive side of the ball in spots where this league is loaded this upcoming season. There are a lot of good quarterbacks in the league, and there are probably the best running back collection in the country plays in the Big 12. Uh, and And that's where, like, I mean, Taj Brooks is on there. I think, Drew, you had Taj Brooks on your list, so props to you for going two for two on the running back picks and getting that right. But, like, I, I, Taj Brooks, I did not have him on mine. Like, I thought it was going to be Devin Neal uh, or deserving to be Devin Neal, DJ Giddens, or maybe even, you know, Josh Harvey down at UCF. Uh, uh, I don't think he's not, overrated, but I just – I do. I, I do, and I know it's going to be very controversial and – I just thought Tosh Brooks belongs on the first team. I realized he got all those yards last year, but he didn't get that many touchdowns. He had six touch. He had so many less touches than Devin Neal, but six less touchdowns. That mean, I mean, he had so many more touches yeah. than Devin Neal, but six less touchdowns. He got a lot of opportunities that other running backs in the league that are better did not get. Part of that is because his quarterback freaking sucked. So I think a product of how good he was last year was just that stat driven thing because they had nobody else like if everyone else is getting the amount of touches that he is their yards per carry they would just blow him out of the water in my opinion he's i think he's the fifth or sixth best running back in the big 12 i, I wonder how much josh brooks ends up making it because people were split between Devin neal dj giddens and rj harvey i mean <laughs> I, I think that 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 probably plays a factor in this too of and everybody I would take probably every single one of those over Taj brooks <laughs> i think that everybody's pretty split on them yeah, I, I think I, I think Taj Brooks gets a lot. Like there, you think of Tech, and you go, okay, who's kind of been the 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 pulse for them there? And it, you know that that's the guy you have to worry about. But at the end of the day, it's just tough to find a spot for for K State right now. Now, if you're if you voted and you think that by the end of the year that K State won't be deserving of having somebody on there, then I do think you're an idiot. And that's where I think you do have to start to kind of say in your head, like. This is supposed to be a predictive thing. So the thought should be, okay, is K-State really not going to have a single person on the first team at the end of the year, especially if they're playing for the conference title? Logically, it's basically a straight-up no there. They're going to have somebody there, you would think. So kind of fascinating to see how the uh, voting ended up working out and uh, certainly something that K-State individually, the players can use for motivation. Now, in terms of, Team-wise, we got a look at the preseason Big 12 media poll and uh, pretty fascinating how it worked out. I don't have a ton of major gripes with it because uh, it's fairly similar, I think, to what 
all three of us ended up putting out. But Utah, I think we kind of expected this. Utah was going to be at the top uh, only by one vote over K-State, though. So there were, was a large number of people uh, that, that still think the Cats are in play there. Oklahoma State came in third. They got 14 first-place votes. KU at fourth, they got five first-place votes. And Arizona was the other team to get first-place votes. They got three, um, probably two people from Tucson, and then one other person that thought, well, they were really good last year, but didn't realize that they had a coaching change and everything else that went on. Uh, rest of the list looks like Iowa State at six, and then West Virginia, UCF, Texas Tech, TCU, Colorado, Baylor, BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and Arizona State. Um, we're all in agreement that those are the bottom six teams in the Big 12, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but 10 and up, what stood out to you guys with the all Big 12 uh, preseason uh, predictions there with the actual poll in terms of how the order of finish would look? I don't. I forget exactly how I had my rankings when we did a our thing earlier. I don't know if, but what I will say is, in terms of those bottom six, I don't know if I would agree on those bottom six. There I were guess, our picks before. This yeah, season. I was going to say. I uh, that's what I was going to say. I think I have TCU in the bottom six. Yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah. So I I'm not a big lover of the frogs this year. I got them pretty low. I, I got West Virginia pretty low too. I guess. Um, a lot lower than everyone else as well. So those are probably the two that I would disagree on the most. I have West Virginia a lot lower. I have TCU a lot lower. I have Houston a lot higher. I think Baylor could surprise a little bit. I think Texas Tech could surprise a little bit. Yeah, I think that the one team that, I mean, yeah, I even have, only have Texas Tech at seven, but I think that they're probably a team that is a little bit too low on everybody's list at nine, just with how the schedule kind of plays out for Texas Tech. I know that we've kind of talked about how they could potentially be like five or six and oh, if everything goes right for them, they stay healthy. Uh, the other one that really jumped out again is West Virginia at seven. I just, I just don't see them finishing in the top half with how their schedule is and kind of think not to mention the, uh, the Big 12 radio RIP guys, uh, that had them in like their yes. top three. Yes, uh, like I, I just think that's a little a little high for my taste. West when Virginia I, could miss a bowl. Yeah. Yes, yeah. everything was a little bit of fool's goldy last year, and they could probably miss a bowl this year. Uh, and then Baylor, I think, is the toughest team for everyone to project, so probably having them at 12 makes sense because nobody really knows what's going on there. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, a good point, and they're – they're a pretty strong wild card candidate for where they could kind of fluctuate you, in the Big do you, Twelve. Do you think? Do you think Colorado is a wild card at all? Uh, no, no, no. I think I think they've got a pretty hard cap at like seven wins is their pie in the sky ceiling. Like that would be, uh, I think, an act of God to get Colorado to seven wins. I yeah, like Oklahoma State a lot. I had them too, um, but. I'll say I was a little surprised they had as many first place votes as they did. Yeah, that does seem like a lot. Uh, I I wasn't surprised to see KU get some. Uh, I mean, and, uh, and I showed fourteen him, though. Fourteen's a lot for Oklahoma State. I mean, uh, and I thought they'd be fourth. And I know Drew had Oklahoma State fifth. And I think this comes down to, um, you know, we we just saw all like the EA stuff come out last week, and Oklahoma State fans were like, "How can Oklahoma State be this low with their?" offensive ranking or whatever when they've got all of these offensive linemen back they've got ollie gordon back they've got brennan presley like what's going on well i think that just goes to show that what they were able to do last year people feel like is not probably replicable replicable with alan bowman as your quarterback i think that really is what uh comes into play but so i'm i'm surprised that enough people were able to look past having probably the worst quarterback in the big 12 uh, when when all the guys are healthy, and maybe he's a little bit better than no, what like Arizona State not the Daddy are going out. He's, he's, he's definitely better. bottom three or four. He's bottom half for sure, but he's better would, than whoever Arizona State's going to trot out there, and he's better than Soresby at Cincinnati. Yeah, and I would still take him over Donovan Smith at Houston and mm. Jerry Bohannon at BYU. Like he's yeah. he's like probably bottom I, and, five. I, and and I'd take him over Josh Hoover. I think I'd probably take Donovan Smith and Jerry Bohannon with Ollie Gordon as their running back <laughs> over Alan Bowman, but 
Whatever. What up, Shout Josh? Out to no state fan that'll watch very, this. Very ageist by Mason to hate the 28 year old Alan <laughs> Bowman. Hey, the well, last time yeah, Oklahoma State had a quarterback like this it was Brandon Whedon, and that went well. So, yeah, I will say too, it it shows how fun that I think that the league is going to be this year and going forward to have five teams receive first place votes. And I don't really have a gripe for any of them. Like Arizona, if everything goes well, you can probably say that they'd win it. KU, their, their schedule, if they stay healthy, like they'd have a shot. I'll be and honest. K State, Utah, obviously, are the top three. I, I'll be honest. I don't know if we dove into this conversation the last time that we've done it because I never realized this is the second time. I'm sure we'll do this a third time even before the season starts. KU definitely contender. Uh, as long as Jalen Daniels stays healthy, they can win the Big 12. Oklahoma State can win the Big 12. K State can win the Big 12. Utah can win the Big 12. I don't think anybody else can. Like there's Iowa State, West Virginia stuff, fake. That's not real. I don't believe it at all. UCF, not real. I don't understand. I like UCF could have a pretty solid year if, if it clicks with KJ Jefferson, but it's not going to be good enough to win the Big 12. As much as I like Texas Tech, if anything, everything clicks and the quarterback stays healthy, they could have a really good year, but it's not good enough to win the Big 12. And the last one that everyone's like on is Arizona. You know, new coach, new league. Like, I don't see it. I don't think they're a true Big 12 title contender. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, th- I think that's probably a fair assessment. Now, uh, in, in terms of, and this will be the last thing that, that we kind of go over. So K-State gets in that spot. They get the, the 19 first place votes. Uh, I do I do want it to be known that uh, it was revealed to me yesterday. Mitch Fortner of K-Man forgot to submit his ballot. So just so if did. anybody wants to... So did I throw him to the wolves. So, so did I. So if oh if, no, and I would and I would have had Utah third, as you saw too, as when you pull it up, and, and Mitch probably would have had K State first. So if Mitch and I wouldn't have like <laughs> like fallen there, like you're like it's literally down to me and Mitch why K State was probably not picked to win the Big Twelve. Yep, and I, I, you guys were the only two I'm sure that forgot to send in your ballots. So this is yeah. on. Mitch yeah, and DY, if you're if you're worried about K State being the uh, preseason poll pick, uh, your your votes matter, people. This is just a <laughs> it's a it's a political statement by Drew by uh, Mitch and DY that uh, votes matter in a roundabout way. It's funny because Mitch brought that up yesterday and he got to talking about it when I was was on the game, and then I I had this thought come to me that I had a history teacher in high school that uh, it was probably around election time. Uh, one year, and he was talking about oh, how important it is to get out and vote or whatever. And he, there, he was talking about some guy he knew that there was like a local race that it was going on, and so like you know, it's Bueller, Kansas, so votes votes matter a little bit more in Bueller and Reno County than they do in some places. Uh, and the guy ends up losing by just like a handful of votes, like you know, probably less than ten or something. And so he's calling up all these people that said, hey, I'm, you've got my vote. I'm going to be there for you because, it, you know, it's public record when not who you voted for, but when you voted like, oh, you voted in the 2016 primary or you voted in the 2016 general election or whatever. And so he was able to go around and be like, well, I should have had this guy, this guy and this guy. And uh, he called him up and he's like, hey, let's count on your vote. What happened, man? <laughs> and so then that was my uh, history teacher's way of like explaining to us like, yep, go out. You should go out and vote every year. Cause uh, you never know when it's going to matter. So uh, just not two very bad Americans, D Y and Mitch Fortner. So <laughs> oh, how dare right. you do that on the 4th of July, by the way? Yeah, that's <laughs> tough. 4th of July weekend. And they forget to vote. And also I'd like another careless mistake by the big 12 and the diagram that they put in the email when they sent out as the results of this, instead of UCF, it says UF. UF. Yeah. yeah. It's like, don't you have like a mountain of like editors or people that are probably looking through that, checking that? Before no, no, up? definitely not at this level. Well, I don't think it, so. With it, the... If they do, they're probably looking for employment. It's kind no, of, I, it's I, I'm guessing it's looking at this. Nah, not well, the actual like, probably media that they put out on Twitter or anything, but the me- the email that they send out, they're probably just popping off real quick. I don't think anybody's doubling over that and uh, checking it out, but yeah, there you go. All right. That's uh, they're definitely screwing up the tiebreaker again this year. 
Oh, now, well, that's, now that's a good that's a good example. Uh, it, people are going to have pretty low faith in you if you can't even get UCF's name right. To uh, it's only three letters. Come on, like, and the C is a pretty important one. Like you could do without. Oh, they don't like it, right? But you could do without the U in there. And you just need to know that it's Central Florida. Yeah. It's a big deal with the uh, with the the C being gone, but. Uh, Probably I, who liked that less, UCF or Florida being included in that? Uh, we'll have to, that'll be a debate raging on for a while. But all right. Well, that'll do it for us. We have plenty of stuff coming your way this week. Also, a handful of K State recruits uh, that might be announcing their commitment to the Wildcats in the near future. So if that happens, be sure to come right here to the KSO YouTube and check out Drew and I's breakdown of that and then get all the other supplemental stuff to it with drew and dy over at kstateonline.com you can find us at on three so for drew galloway Derek young i'm mason vo thanks for watching k-state